Writing Out Loud. A program designed to explore in-depth interviews with writers to hear that words have voices. Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Miller and welcome to Writing Out Loud. My super special guest today is mega best-selling author Katherine Stockett. Her novels, The Help. Thank you for being here, Kitty. Thank you, Teresa. You were in New York when you started The Help. How did this story come to you? I lived downtown and uh, I think I'd been there about seven or eight years and um, I had taken a month off of work to work on a book, mm -hmm. um, a book that was not very good mm -hmm. and uh, I sat down at my desk and, and you know started to write and it was September 11th. Oh my. And yeah. it put the brakes on everything. But my first uh, reaction, you know, besides fear and, and sadness, really was homesickness. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't, you know, all of our phone lines had been cut. There was no cell service. We were mm -hmm. barricaded into our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And the voice that I really, really wanted to hear um, really wasn't my family anyway. Mm -hmm. It was Dimitri. She was the African-American woman mm -hmm. that worked for our family for over 30 years. Mm -hmm. And I, I assume a lot of writers do this. Mm -hmm. you, you can't talk to someone who's passed away, so you write in their voice. And that is how I, I don't know, that's how I could hear Dimitri mm -hmm. speaking to me again. So this is, in a way, your conversation, your ongoing conversation with her. Well, yeah, it occurred to me as I started writing in her voice that, um, you know, at the wise old age of 30-something, <laughs> I had never asked her what it felt like to be Dimitri. You know, I was mm -hmm. a child. I was a little mm -hmm. fortunate white child in Mississippi, mm -hmm. and, you know, you just you don't think about anybody but yourself. And she gave us so much. She gave us so much time and so much more than what you know, was expected of her as, as a housekeeper. Um, I, I have friends that, that say they were raised by the black women that worked in their homes. Mm -hmm. um, Dimitri worked for my grandmother, so I wouldn't say I was raised by her, but she, she made a huge impact mm -hmm. on my life. Mm -hmm. You begin and end the book in Abilene's voice. Is she the true heroine of the novel? Well, Abilene to me is Dimitri. Okay. Um, Dimitri died when I was 16, mm -hmm. and uh, I, because I was so, you know, shy about writing as a, you know, a white woman mm -hmm. in a black voice, mm -hmm. um, I started with a character that was humble and um, hesitant, mm -hmm. because I think it reflected the way I was feeling about what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, if you as you get to know me, you will realize I, I can't I can't be quiet for for too long. <laughs> um, things just come out of my mouth, mm -hmm. and uh, so I wrote uh, the first chapter of the book. Um, it was the first thing I wrote, and and you know it went on for probably 30, 40 pages, and then I you know I started getting itchy, mm -hmm. and I had things mm -hmm. to say. Mm -hmm. You know, once I'd gotten <laughs> a little more comfortable, and and that's how many was born. Many. Yeah. Many. Is she based at all on your friend Octavia Spencer, who played? Many. I. Well, first of all, let me say that Octavia is extremely intelligent, very well educated. Um, she's a fantastic actress. Mm -hmm. Obviously, she's a writer. Mm -hmm. Her book came out in 2013, and um, so, you know. I didn't know Octavia that well, mm -hmm. but she lived with Tay Taylor, the director of the film. And so, you know, we've been at parties together. We've had dinner together mm -hmm. many times. Um, you know, I had conversations with her, but we weren't like that. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, you just watch her and you listen to her intonations and how she moves her body and how she reacts to things. And I thought, I want to get that on the page. Mm -hmm. And that, that's how many really came, took shape. As you were writing this book, did you have any sense that it was going to resonate with people like it has? Oh no, oh heavens, I couldn't get an agent. I thought, you know, if I got an agent, if I, someone would even publish it, I would maybe get some people from the South to read it. <laughs> but I, I didn't imagine it would 
go beyond that. I'm still surprised. <laughs> well, it's a pretty good surprise. I mean, you got like 60 rejections. I got 60 agent rejections, which is, if you know anybody that's been in publishing knows that in fiction, that's your first door. Mm -hmm. If you don't have an agent, I mean, I know self-publishing has, has come along strong, but you know, that really didn't exist so much. You know, it's, it's a fairly new thing. Um, yeah, and I got a lot of doors slammed in my face, and I don't know, I just, I'm stubborn. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you what kept you going, and you're stubborn, but it, you also had to have a very strong belief in this book. Um, I had a belief, I had an understanding um, with the story and how it made me feel. Mm -hmm. um, and I won't say there was a vindictiveness as much as I got a real kick out of writing about some people that I had grown up with and watched mm -hmm. in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking, what if I could turn the tables just for a minute, just for just a for chapter, a maybe for a book, which, you know, is, is, as you know, it doesn't turn for long in the book. But I really, I, I think I just wrote it for my own amusement. Mm -hmm. Of course, it takes place in the early 1960s during the Civil Rights era. And you make a great statement in the book. You say you were afraid you didn't say enough. You were afraid you said too much. I wonder if you might elaborate on that. Wow, boy, race is such a sticky subject. Mm -hmm. um, I just had a you know two-hour conversation with um, my boyfriend last night about this. Why? Some people are allowed to say some things, and other people are not, strictly based on color. Mm -hmm. and, and we talked about, you know, words that are terrible, and 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 the and but what happens when someone, um, either on purpose or accident, says something that comes off as racist, and how everything stops, everything shuts down, mm -hmm. and people are so afraid to discuss race. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is because they know it's a career killer, mm -hmm. and and therefore um, it's it stopped people from having, you know, human conversations mm -hmm. because they're so nervous they're going to say the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that statement that I made reflects that. Mm -hmm. I don't. I wanted to say more. Mm -hmm. I should have, at times, I think, said less. Mm -hmm. But I just, I'm so frustrated with, with people being afraid to discuss this topic. And that was even truer back in the early 60s, don't you think? No, actually yeah. I don't. Uh -huh. I think people said what was on their mind. Mm -hmm. um, which, as, as we know, mm -hmm. I mean look at the Little Rock, Arkansas, it's on film. Mm -hmm. People using terrible words people throwing rocks, mm -hmm. girls 14 years old saying, I don't want them in my school. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think people did speak a lot freer. I don't, I don't want them speaking in that way, mm -hmm. but to stop speaking altogether about a problem that mm -hmm. still exists. I mean, we're still celebrating what happened in 1964. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're so proud of ourselves by the progress we've made but nothing has really happened in a lot of places mm -hmm. since the Civil Rights Act. Mm -hmm. Merle Evers, Maker's Widow, has written a wonderful essay about the help. Have you read it? I have. Oh, it's such a powerful piece. She's an amazing woman. She is amazing, and she calls your book a touchstone book. What does that kind of endorsement mean to you personally and professionally? It's incredible to come from someone like Merle. She's so dear. Um, it it just it blows me away. I can't believe that. I don't know. I, I, I can't believe that people took notice the way they did. And a, a lot of people got angry. Mm -hmm. And um, and some people got embarrassed. But when you have people talking about a book um, and when you have African Americans coming forward and saying hey it was like that mm -hmm. um, or you have a white person you know having a discussion with her book club mm -hmm. um, that's a conversation that wouldn't have happened 
So when I hear somebody like Marley, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. has even, I don't know, it's even been in her brain, yeah. that is yeah. just so yeah. valuable to me. Oh, absolutely. And she lived in Jackson during the time. She lived in Jackson. Megger Evers um, was assassinated uh, in their front yard. Um, well, I got chills when I read her essay. I just thought, that what a wonderful tribute to Kitty and to the, to the story and to the voices that you bring forth in the book. What's been the reaction in Jackson? Um, good and bad. Um, I think the local book- bookstore has um, had a lot of fun with it. <laughs> Lemuria is you know, my hometown bookstore that yeah. I love. And uh, you know, I think that some people have really got their feelings hurt, Mm. Um, which is interesting to me because it takes place in the 60s, -hmm. you know, and and there are people that are still feeling the sting of what I'm saying their mothers or grandmothers did. Mm -hmm. Um, There were some people that said maybe they thought, you know, I was writing about them. Mm-hmm. Oh, that always happens. That always happens with writers. And I think that doesn't reflect well on you at all to say that. <laughs> I'm talking about the white women. Uh huh. But you know. Well, you know what your fellow Mississippian said about that. Uh, you, Dora Welty was once asked if her characters were based on people she knew, and she said, "I don't think you know anyone ever well enough to write about them." So oh, you couldn't wow. do that. <laughs> you couldn't do that even if, if you wanted. Well, I didn't write about anyone that really existed, except I used Dimitri's voice. I used Octavia's intonations. But for most of the white characters, you know, you take a little of this, a little of that, and you put it in the cocktail shaker, you know, yeah. and you get the character that you want. Yeah. Or sometimes the characters you don't want but have to deal with anyway. That's true. Mentioned Eudora Welty. What is it about Jackson, Mississippi that brings forth so many great writers? Wow. I don't know if it's Jackson alone. I, I would have to give credit to the whole state. Mm-hmm. Then again, maybe we should just talk about the whole South. There's so many great Southern writers. I mean, it's incredible. So many writers, just this belt. Mm-hmm. You know, all the way up to Tulsa. No, all the I mean, way if up you to Tulsa. And I, I, look, everybody can claim that they have incredible talent from mm-hmm. from their state mm-hmm. in America. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's just not that much to do in Jackson, Mississippi. <laughs> yeah. So you often have to entertain yourself. Absolutely, and your friends. I mean, you have to be good storytellers in order to captivate the people around you. What's your quick take on Eudora Welty? I absolutely love her. I told you I, I read Why I Live at the P.O. yesterday. Mm-hmm. You know, I keep it, I have a tiny little pocket size. Um, she's incredible. She, um, she lived down the street from my grandfather. Mm-hmm. Um, she, would, she liked, to, my grandfather had a stables, a mm-hmm. horse stables, called Stockett Stables, and she used to come sit down there with all the men. Mm-hmm. And I really think she was doing what she knew to do best, and that was listen. She's written some incredible essays about mm-hmm. listening. Mm-hmm. But one day she came in and she had her typewriter and um, <laughs> it was just a cheap little travel thing. And mm-hmm. Granddaddy had taken, in exchange for some horse rent or something or, you know, boarding, um, someone gave him a typewriter, a mm-hmm. big royal. Mm-hmm. And Eudora saw that and said, I'll trade typewriters <laughs> with you, Robert. And Robert really didn't have a, a, you know, a use for it. So they traded typewriters. and. Yeah. I don't know. I think. I don't know, but I think it's in the Eudora Welty house. <laughs> Beth Henley. Amazing. I read her plays all the time to pick up the rhythm of her dialogue. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, you know, I love Miss Firecracker, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Just the way, the beats and how she knows to pop a punchline. Mm-hmm. I've learned so much about humor from Beth. Mm-hmm. Your narrator Skeeter's also a writer. How closely do you relate to her? Oh, I don't. Uh, do you not? No. I think it was a real amateur move, honestly, to have a, you know, write about a writer who's do trying you to get a book so? pu- published. And it's funny, I wrote most of it before I realized um, 
<laughs> I might be too clever for my own good, you know. <laughs> it, you, it was you could definitely see the, the theater strings being pulled there, but um, I don't know. I don't. I wouldn't consider Skeeter and I having much in common at all. She's. I. I don't know. I was trying to write a, a brave character mm-hmm. who's doing something about it while things were happening. Mm-hmm. Um, it didn't take a whole lot of bravery to write about something, uh, you know, 70 years later. <laughs> well, it, take, it takes some. It, it, it truly, truly does. I wanted to ask you about your friend Tate, because was he part of the picture when you were writing your book? Did you think, I want Tate to direct the film version of this? We grew up together. Um, we lived down the street from each other in Jackson. Tate was, he, he says the word raised all the time by mm-hmm. Carol Lee because his mom was a real estate agent. She worked hard, mm-hmm. Tate's mom, mm-hmm. and he was home with Carol Lee an awful lot. And uh, so, you know, we, we moved to New York together, mm-hmm. and then he went to L.A., and I stayed in New York, and we passed work back and forth. You know, terrible, awful things. <laughs> you know, uh-huh. just, but we didn't care because all we wanted was yeah. an honest opinion. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we were, we had a ball making the movie. Oh, I bet. I give Tate full credit. I just um, got to stand back and watch and laugh and have fun. And he did the screenplay, right? He wrote the screenplay. Did you have quite a bit of input? Um, and you know, he'd call me a lot and ask me questions at the beginning and I'd just be like, this is your problem. <laughs> this is not my problem anymore. In what ways do you think the film complements the novel? Um, well, he, I think he did a great job sticking to the story where it was mm-hmm. important, mm-hmm. but he made some real key decisions, like in the film he has uh, many working directly for Hilly. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I like to write things a little more nuanced mm-hmm. um, because you have time in a book, mm-hmm. but in a movie, you know, you got 120 pages. You got mm-hmm. l- less than two hours for most audiences. You got to get to the point. Mm-hmm. So I love that he put that impact right from the get-go. You had to be thrilled when Octavia Spencer got the Oscar. Oh, yeah. That was amazing. Yeah. I, what did you say to her? What, what did you say to her the next you time? Know, you know, I didn't, I don't think I saw her. She was whisked away. I was sitting there in the row, you know, a couple, some rows back, uh-huh. watching her get it. And then she, I mean, I think she was really the darling of the night. Oh, yeah. And I remember um, the next morning opening up a newspaper and she hadn't gone to bed. She, all she'd done were interviews. <laughs> and her, this interview um, was of her at like, you know, five o'clock in the morning. Oh my. You know, oh my. but still looking, you know, as fresh and excited. Adrenaline will do that. Oh, it will. You've had five years now to reflect on the help. Is there anything you'd change about it? The book? Mm-hmm. Oh, I'd, I'd go back and edit the whole thing. If oh, I seriously? Oh yeah, I don't ever stop editing. I wish that I had um, included a few things that I cut out. I wish I had cut out some things that I included, but (laughs) I won't go into detail on that because... The writer's lament. You know, it's done. It is done. And you do say in your afterword, and I love your afterword. I learned so much about you as a writer from the afterword. And you talk about a line you truly prize. And I wonder if you would read this line from the book and then tell us why it means so much to you. Wasn't that the point of the book, for women to realize we are just two people, not that much separates us, not nearly as much as I'd thought. Um, well, I, it, now that I read it, it's a little on the nose, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> but I was trying to write about a character that was going through this journey mm-hmm. and this, this self-realization, um, and I, sometimes, you know, I think you just got to make it plain and obvious. <laughs> and, and I wish that more people would realize that. It's a lesson that I have to remind myself of all the time. We talked about Dimitri at the top of the show. If you could have a conversation with Dimitri today, what would you want to say to her? Gosh, I, I guess I would say I'm sorry. It was such a childish child, and thank you for all the things that she gave me. Um, just, you know, self-respect, and she made me laugh. Mm -hmm. Um, She gave, you know, she didn't have children of her own. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, when you'd ask her how many kids she had, though, 
she'd say three, and she'd mm -hmm. mean me, my brother, and mm -hmm. my sister. But she didn't. And, and she dedicated so much of her life hmm. to us. How do you think Dimitri would feel about the book? I don't know. I, I, I have no idea. She died when I was 16. Yeah. You know, she's yeah. frozen in time for me. I never saw her in anything but her white uniform, mm. Mm. except, you know, in the casket. Two, two strikingly different images of her. Yeah, but to, to have gone through someone's whole life, you know, mm -hmm. I never have seen them in anything but a white dress. Mm. You have a young daughter. She made a cameo appearance in the film. That had she to did. be exciting. Yeah. Was she nervous? Not really. She, she She's loves natural. to act. Yeah, she just did um, a cameo in Tate's film, um, Get On Up. It's the story of James Brown. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah it's fantastic. Yeah. Octavia's in it. Oh, you know, cool. Once yeah. again, just put in all your friends. Uh, yeah, well, um, it, it's worked for you. Yeah, so Lila got to play young Skeeter in The Help. She plays, um, I can't remember what her character's name was, in um, the James Brown movie. And uh, she's on an audition right now. Oh. Yeah, for a movie, but we'll see. Yeah. What's her reaction to The Help? She hasn't read it. What She's you, 11, but. What do you think she will see in this book about you when she reads this? Um, I don't know. I feel like at some point, if I keep writing books, she's, she may have to go to some therapy because <laughs> I travel so much. Uh-huh. And, uh, and I don't know if she reads it. Maybe she'll think, okay, now I understand why mm -hmm. she had to lock herself in a room sometimes and write and not be with mm -hmm. me. And hopefully, I don't know understand that I gave what I could, mm -hmm. but uh, she's just, she's such a cool kid. Oh, I bet. She's so naive about race. Mm -hmm. she, mm -hmm. she doesn't even really use the word black. She says, he's got brown skin, or she has, she has light brown skin, mm -hmm. he has dark brown skin. He's, you know, they don't, I mean, she's, she goes to public school. She's, mm -hmm. her friends are white, her friends are dark, you know, she's, um, she just she didn't have that awareness that I mm -hmm. had so er, at so mm -hmm. early of an age, and honestly, I'm not looking forward to bursting that bubble yet. No, I can understand. I can understand. I wanted to ask you about your new book because you are working on a new book. Yeah. Tell us about it. Well, uh, it took me a while to get started on it mm -hmm. um, because I I just I had so much fun, you know, mm -hmm. the movie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and and the you know it's it's a it was a year touring for the hardcover, it was a year touring for the paperback, it was a year making the movie, and then there was press for the movie, and then you know it took me a while to really sit down, but I, I, it's it's coming, yeah. you know. It's, yeah. I think I'm about uh, sixty percent through. Oh, that's good. Well, you know, I should be further, but um, yeah, it takes place in Oxford, Mississippi, mm -hmm. um, which is you know Faulkner's town. Oh and, yes, I've been. Um, there. But it. Uh, goes back in time a little more to the 1930s mm -hmm. during the Depression. I hope it's not a depressing book. <laughs> I hope it's just funny as hell because, <laughs> you know, I've tried to set up this very macabre background where you should be sad, but I I'll, I feel like I'm just, I'm just cracking myself up writing it. I don't know <laughs> if anyone else is going to think it's funny. Did you learn lessons from writing the help that it really working for you with a new book. You would think you would, right? Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. it's like I've never written a thing, not an English term paper, <laughs> nothing. That, you start all over with every book. Well, you know a question I've heard recently from a lot of your fans, people that fell in love with Minnie and Abilene and Skeeter, they wonder if you'll ever write a sequel to The Help. Um, I don't think I'll write a sequel. I could see myself maybe writing a prequel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, a prequel. I'm not really, yeah, kind of like where were these people before 1963? Mm -hmm. um, I'm just not really interested in uh, Mississippi in the 70s. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the hair was bad, <laughs> the makeup was bad. <laughs> Wasn't as interesting an era for you. It's, it's not, it's, it's when, I'm telling you, it's when people stop talking about it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. 70s, 80s. So I don't feel like going there. I like to go back and see 
when things were hot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you think back on the book, did you change at all as a writer from, from writing this book? Did it change you as a person at all? Um, well, I mean, I've got better shoes now. <laughs> yeah, I know, a lot better shoes. But I mean, did it bring up subjects that maybe you hadn't really thought about that much as you got started on it? Um, well, you know, it, yeah, it was a, a real self-discovery mm -hmm. period for me, thinking about Dimitri and thinking about how I might have acted so badly growing up, just so just ignorant. So you've, you've asked us the hard questions, and now we have to answer them for ourselves, and then we look forward to the, to the new book. And I want to ask you quickly, you're not going to do a sequel, but do you ever think about Minnie? Do you ever think about Abilene? Uh-uh. They're gone for you? <laughs> They're gone. I mean, I, I think of Abilene because I think of Dimitri. Yes. I guess I think, no, I don't. I, I, I'd really, somebody, I think my publisher asked me to write like, what happens to these people after the book's done? And I just wrote just this horrifying freak <laughs> show of a, you know, of a, you know, Mae Mobley's a little girl, she dies of strep. Oh, and, no. um, you know, Leroy, Minnie's husband, gets hit by a car. Oh, and, no. But I just, you know, they're, they're just on the page. They're just on I, the page. I like to think about what happened to them before they entered these pages, but beyond that, it's up to us. It's up to your fans. It's up to your readers to, to yeah. imagine. Thank you so much, Kitty, for being here. Thank you. And thank all of you for joining us on Writing Out Loud.